making headlines on this Friday. South Korea says North Korea carries the full responsibility over the shutdown of a jointly run industrial park. It has evidence that the Kaesong Park served as a source of cash for the North development of weapons of mass destruction. South Korea unveils aid measures to minimize losses incurred by South Korean enterprises with factories at the now closed joint factory zone in North Korea. And shares lose ground all across the Asian board. For the first time in four and a half years, Korea's tech heavy Kosdaq halted trading at one point as the index plunged more than 8%. New Center begins right now. Good evening. Two days since South Korea pulled the plug from the inter-Korean joint industrial complex in Kaesong and a day since North Korea expelled the South Korean personnel and said it would freeze all assets there, the Seoul government in charge of relations with North Korea says there is evidence that Pyongyang used cash earned from the Kaesong industrial complex to develop its weapons of mass destruction. Kim mo has our top story. South Korea's unification minister Hong Yong-pyo strongly criticized North Korea for its unilateral response towards the closing of the Kaesong industrial complex. At a press briefing on Friday, Hong said that North Korea should take responsibility over its actions, revealing that the Seoul government has collected evidence of Pyongyang funneling money generated from the Kaesong Park into developing its nuclear weapons and missiles. There are rising concerns that North Korea has been using money earned through Kaesong as a source of income for developing its weapons of mass destruction. I cannot reveal everything, but the government has collected several meaningful pieces of evidence related to the issue. He said that despite South Korea's continuous efforts to keep the joint industrial park running due to its significance, North Korea has made it a place that no longer represents peaceful cooperation between the two Koreas. Kim mo Arirang News. South Korea has cut all power and water supplies into the jointly run industrial park after North Korea deported South Korean personnel at the complex and vowed to freeze all assets there. Four South Korean companies with factories at the industrial zone, the Seoul government has unveiled a set of aid measures to minimize their losses. Our Connie Kim files this report from Seoul's Ministry of Unification. South Korea was quick in laying out support measures for its companies that operated at the inter-Korean Kaesong Industrial Complex in the north and who were expelled from it on Thursday. The measures, which are the result of discussions from eight ministries, the Financial Services Commission and the Small and Medium Business Administration, will be provided immediately. The measures the government is announcing are aimed at providing swift and sufficient support for companies that have operated inside the complex to minimize their losses. To provide emergency liquidity to firms, Seoul will extend the majority of loans companies received from the Fund for the Cooperation between South and North Korea. Insurance benefits will be given immediately to companies who had signed up for inter-Korean economic cooperation insurance. National and local taxes will be deferred and utility bills, including electricity fees, will be supported. Also, a one-on-one -on -one hotline will be established for the companies to provide needed support as soon as possible. Some 920 million U.S. dollars were reported as losses by the South Korean companies during the five-month shutdown back in 2013. This time around, however, losses are estimated to be double the amount of the total investment South Korea funneled in since the industrial park was established. But Seoul says the shutdown was an inevitable measure. We knew there were going to be difficulties we would have to bear from the shutdown, but we had to make the decision for the countries and the people's safety. And with the electricity and water at the park now cut off, this has been the strongest measure Seoul has put on the last vestige of South North economic cooperation. With the Kaesong complex shut down, there are concerns ties between the two Koreas have regressed to the same state they were 44 years ago when the inter-Korean hotline was first established. Connie Kim, Arirang News. 
Meanwhile, those South Korean businessmen held an emergency meeting demanding the South Korean government to compensate for the damages caused by this sudden suspension. Our Kim Min-ji reports from the Corporate Association of the Kaesong Industrial Complex. Representatives of South Korean firms that operated at the Kaesong Industrial Complex say the government must take responsibility for expected economic damages following the abrupt suspension. The association demanded the government to provide compensation for the losses the companies will face and swiftly restore operations at the industrial park, saying it's a symbol of peaceful coexistence and inter-Korean cooperation. In regards to the government support measures, the association said they are no different from three years ago after operations were suspended for some 160 days. The government must keep its promise to facilitate normal operation regardless of the situation on the peninsula, as agreed upon in August 2013 when restoring operations at the industrial park. For many business owners, their livelihoods are on the line as some are based solely in Kaesong, meaning their businesses have vanished overnight. Back in 2013, South Korean firms reported a combined loss of over 1 trillion won or over 900 million U.S. dollars. I don't know how I'm going to make a living from now on. I might have to look for a job after February. I wasn't even able to collect any personal belongings. Some expect the consequences to be even greater this time round, as companies had to leave the complex empty-handed after North Korea froze all assets. Because the announcement was so abrupt, we couldn't prepare in advance. Three years ago, we had some time, so we were able to bring out up to 80 to 90 percent of our materials. This time, we have nothing, so the economic damages will be unimaginable. The company representatives called for the government's swift actions that can help workers sustain a living and minimize losses, as well as a chance to reclaim finished goods and raw materials left behind in North Korea. Kim min -ji. Arirang News. Now, these businessmen with operations at the now suspended Kaesong Industrial Park also met with the nation's lawmakers today. For potential support systems for these firms, are discussed by the rival political party lawmakers, our parliamentary correspondent Shin Semin reports. Businessmen representing firms based in Kaesong Complex made their way to the parliament to meet with lawmakers as they seeked ways to deal with the fallout from an abrupt halt of the jointly run factory site. The rival political parties agreed on the need for additional measures to compensate firms for the damages. The ruling Sanduri party even went as far as announcing it may introduce a special law to minimize the losses. The government set up an emergency planning committee and announced support measures, but our party believes additional measures are needed. Should existing law and system prove insufficient, we are more than willing to legislate a special law in this case. However, the main opposition, the major party of Korea, questioned the fundamental need to halt operations at the complex, adding the shutdown of the site will cause a greater economic losses to South Korea. We need to review whether the complete halt of the complex was the right call, as there is no certainty that it will directly curve development of any nuclear weapons program or rocket launch. Meeting face to face, the six businessmen representatives appealed to lawmakers that the damage will be much greater than previously estimated as the North froze all assets in the jointly run factory park. The association demanded Parliament launch an investigative committee to gauge the damages incurred by the firms, as well as determine whether a complete halt was a necessary move. Aside from coming up with measures to compensate the firms, the two main rival parties maintained its differing position on the complete shutdown of the Kaesong Industrial Complex, as the opposition party accused the government of taking advantage of an anti-North Korean sentiment ahead of the April's general election. Shin Semin, Arirang News. In the wake of North Korea's recent provocations, President Park Geun-hye has stood up to Chinese pressure by moving forward with the deployment of U.S.'s missile defense system and pulled the plug on the inter-Korean venture at Kaesong. 
The South Korean leader's latest series of strategic moves appear to represent a shift in her North Korea policy. Our Song Ji San reads us the fine prints. Unification has been President Park's vision since our inauguration, but on the condition of a nuclear free Korean peninsula. 하나된 한반도를 만들기 위한 이런 노력이 하루빨리 이루어질 수 있도록 북한은 비핵화로 나아가야 합니다. 북한이 핵 문제 해결에 대한 진정성 있는 자세로 육자 회담에 복귀하고 핵을 포기하여 진정 북한 주민들의 삶을 돌보기 바랍니다. But even after three years, Pyongyang has refused to take part in talks on denuclearization while furthering its nuclear development, carrying out its fourth test in January this year. And a month after that, Pyongyang launched a rocket placing its satellite into orbit, but through an apparent use of technologies developed for firing a long-range missile. 이번 북한의 행위는 탄도 미사일 발사를 금지한 UN 안보리 결의를 정면으로 위반한 것으로. 북한의 핵 미사일 위협이 국제 사회에 대한 실질적 위협이자 세계 평화의 전면적인 대항이라는 인식하에 안보리에서 하루속히 강력한 제재 조치를 만들어내야 할 것입니다. But responded with what could be seen as the strongest action from the south, halting operations at the Kaesong Industrial Complex. She also stressed that separate bilateral and multilateral sanctions, in addition to UN resolutions, are needed to curb Pyongyang's nuclear ambitions. The Park administration has tried to establish stable exchanges and dialogue over the past three years, but the North has only advanced its nuclear capabilities. Seoul has acknowledged that inter-Korean relations are meaningless as long as Pyongyang continues to possess nuclear weapons. This is a preemptive measure ahead of other international sanctions to come. With all channels of exchanges between the two Koreas now shut down by the North after it expelled all South Koreans from the Kaesong Industrial Complex, the priority for the Park administration now is national security, as some experts say the inter-Korean dialogue may not resume during the remainder of our term. Song ji Sun, Arirang News. South Korea's foreign minister continues to garner support for collective measures against North Korea in the wake of that regime's latest nuclear and missile threats. Arirang News foreign affairs correspondent Kwon Suwa has more on Minister Yoon Byung says diplomatic efforts in Munich. South Korea's foreign minister Yoon Byung se has called for the cooperation of European countries and NATO members for joint measures in responding to North Korea's recent nuclear and missile threats. Speaking at the Munich Security Conference on Thursday, Yoon said it was time for the international community to show zero tolerance to North Korea's unbridled provocations and that it's time to inflict severe pain on the regime so it'll make the right strategic choice, just as Iran did. Yoon also called for individual countries, as well as international organizations, to play an important role in addition to the UN Security Council's measures. Those measures, meanwhile, have been mulled over for the past month and a week, ever since North Korea's fourth nuclear test. An official at Seoul's foreign ministry said Friday that there has been significant progress on drafting the new resolution over the past week, but that currently more focus is on how strong the resolution will be, rather than on how fast it will be adopted. That's why there are concerns that the process may drag on for months, as was the case in Iran's nuclear deal, especially with no clear word on whether China, North Korea's closest ally, is on board yet for the strongest sanctions to date. And to urge Beijing to step up its role as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, Minister Yun met with his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi in Munich Thursday. While the two agreed on the need for a closer bilateral cooperation, Wang stressed a prudent response considering the interests and concerns of neighboring countries, meaning there is more work to be done to narrow the gap on differences. Kwon Suwa, Arirang News. Neither China nor Russia will play a factor in the South Korean military selection process of where the U.S. anti-missile system will be deployed. 
operational effectiveness and strategic success are the only factors that will be considered when Seoul and Washington sit down for formal talks on this matter next week. Our Kwon Jang Ho files this report from Seoul's Ministry of National Defense. The South Korean military said they will formally sit down with their U.S. counterparts next week to discuss deployment of the THAAD missile defense system. A key topic of discussion will be the location of deployment. The system is expected to be placed at one of the U.S. military bases in South Korea, but there have been concerns from China and Russia that if the system is deployed too far north, it will infringe on their national security. However, South Korean military officials told reporters on Friday that they will not take their concerns into consideration as the safety of the people in Korea was the main priority. China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi reiterated his nation's concerns over the missile system while meeting with his Korean counterpart in Germany on Friday. He added that it is not conducive to maintaining peace and stability in the region. But Korea's military said they will take into consideration any disruption or danger to local residents. There are concerns that electromagnetic waves from the system's radar can affect people's health and the local environment. The radar also needs about five and a half kilometers of clear airspace as it can cause electromagnetic interference to airplanes and explosive equipment. Meanwhile, the military officials also gave an update of the situation on the inter-Korean border. They said no troop activity has been spotted north of the border, but that South Korean forces are staying vigilant. After the shutdown of the Kaesong Industrial Complex, we are looking out for any North Korean troop movement and remain on full alert for any further provocations. Earlier, officials also warned that North Korea could turn the Kaesong Industrial Complex into a military base, like it was before becoming a joint venture between the two Koreas in 2004. Military officials have said they do not know whether the North Korean regime will redeploy troops to the industrial complex, but remain ready for any possibilities. Kwon jang Arirang News. Over in Thailand, the Asia-Pacific's largest annual multinational military drills are underway. South Korea is among those taking part along with the U.S. and Japan. Now, Cobra Gold this year comes on the heels of a missile launch by North Korea that's raised security tensions in North Asia and rekindled concerns in other parts of Asia about the reach and purpose of such a program. Now, defense officials have noted that there is no direct link between those provocations and these annual drills. Our defense correspondent Kim Min is in Thailand and files us this report from the 2016 Cobra Gold exercises. A pair of U.S. F-18 and F-16 fighter jets pounds the coastline. It's the cue for the Allied forces to make their move. Two dozen assault amphibious vehicles, flanked by more than 30 planes, hurtle onto the shore using smoke as cover. Once on land, the troops secure the target. This is all part of an annual Asia-Pacific military exercise dubbed Cobra Gold, which is held in Thailand every year. It's also the largest multinational military exercise in Asia, in which South Korea takes part. Our Navy and Marine Corps work as a team. Through joint trainings abroad, we enhance our performance and we will counter any enemy threats using all our military strengths and capabilities. South Korea is one of 27 nations taking part this year. The others include the United States, Japan, and the host nation, Thailand. The goal is to enhance interoperability and pass on the know-how each country has built up over the years. This terrain is something that we don't have in the U.S. Uh, we have the beaches, but we don't have this kind of tropical woodland environment. So this is an opportunity for us to broaden our capabilities as a Marine Corps, training in these austere conditions, as well as working with partner nations, learning from them how they operate here and some of the best practices learned over the years. The Cobra Gold exercise runs through February 19th. Service members will conduct exercises on land, air, and sea in a determination of their will for a secure and prosperous Asia-Pacific region. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News, Hadiao, Thailand. Global stock markets are on their shakiest footing in years, and Korea is no exception. The benchmark cost closed the day 1.5% lower, and the secondary bores took a beating 
trading was temporarily halted after the benchmark gauge plunged more than 8%. The latest market turmoil, our Huang Jihei is live in the studio with me. Now, Jihei, the first circuit breaker in four and a half years. What happened on the cost stack today? The tech heavy Kazakh today saw shares once nosedive just before launch and sh it shed over 8%. And this, as you just mentioned, triggered a circuit breaker, which is a mechanism that suspends share transactions for 20 minutes if stocks remain falling by 8% or more from the previous trading sessions closed for a minute. So it's basically a system to prevent too much market volatility. At the end of trade, the bourse dropped 6% while the benchmark. Cost be closed below the psychologically important 1,850 level. Over in Japan, the Nikkei closed down almost 5%, plunging below the 15,000 mark for the first time since October 2014. All this comes after benchmark indexes in U.S. and Europe posted sharp declines overnight. The Shanghai Composite, meanwhile, remains closed until this week due to the Lunar New Year holiday, and many analysts are expecting more volatility after the market opens on Monday. Right, so it's a global-wide sensation. Now, what is prompting this extreme volatility, this, this sell-off? It's the slowing global economy that has already been threatening Korea and the rest of the world for quite a time now. The slowdown in China, as well as other emerging markets, coupled with faltering crude oil prices, have darkened the global economic outlook. Sentiment was further subdued after Fed Chair Janet Yellen recently expressed concerns about the U.S. economy. Now, now, the recent rout across global shares is also stemming from persisting worries over how central banks' monetary easing policies will affect banks' earnings. The Bank of Japan and the European Central Bank have both introduced negative interest rates and financial shares actually led the recent losses in world markets. Um, of course, Ichihei, what we're most worried about is whether there's extreme volatility in markets, equity markets will have larger implications down the line. What are we expecting? It's true that some are worried about the possibility of a major financial crisis like the one that we saw back in 2008. And since many economists are not expecting the world economy to regain strong recovery momentum anytime soon, these sentiments are further being bolsters, but whether the global route we're seeing right now will really turn out to be another financial crisis still remains to be in question. One expert that I spoke to does not expect that kind of situation. Financial institutions are in better shape in terms of financial health compared to the past, and that means it can handle more losses. Experts in general do agree that policymakers should keep a close eye on the situation as nothing is really foreseeable in times like now. The government has also pledged to hold a market monetary meeting every day for the time being until markets stabilize. All right. Well, uh, Jihei, uh, thank you so much for that thorough report and, uh, and uh, thank you so much for coming in tonight. Thanks for having me. PyeongChang 2018 Winter Olympic Games. Exactly two years remain until the Winter Games kick off in Korea's eastern resort town of PyeongChang, nearby Pogong and Cheongsan. Now, the uh, 2016 FIS Ski World Cup took place at the newly built Olympics venue in Cheongsan. Not only was this the very first to take place in Korea, but served as an official test event for PyeongChang 2018. Pass or fail for the Cheongsan Alpine Center? I went to find out myself. The Kariwangsan Mountain in Cheongsan, Eastern Korea, is where Korea's first FIS Alpine Ski World Cup is taking place, only the third in Asia. The nation's only downhill course, also an Olympic venue for the 2018 Pyeongchang Games, is making an international debut. Ski fans, athletes and journalists, and nearly 1,800 people are here from all over the world for this first FIS World Cup event here in Korea 
at this Cheongsan Alpine Center. Not only is this the first FIS World Cup here in Korea, this is the very first test event for 2018 PyeongChang Winter Olympic Games. World-class ski racers charged down a remote Korean mountainside on a sun splash day, carving long turns, hurtling through the air off large jumps far from the familiar slopes of the Alps or the Rockies. With two years until the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics, this is the first time top athletes get to ski down this brand new course and evaluate its conditions. I asked Kietil Jensrud of Norway, the winner of the 2016 FIS Alpine World Cup in men's downhill, if the new course is fast and challenging enough for the Pyeongchang Olympics in two years. This is more than an acceptable Olympic venue to ski down and I think it's all about the set, they can adjust something. But the way it was running now, it was almost too fast because the jumps were very, very big. Which is also exciting, so it's a fun, for me it's a fun race. Kitzbühel is dangerous, dangerously scary and this is fun, I mean this is a, this is a cool downhill. A few others did point out that the course is not nearly fast enough for skiers or thrilling enough for spectators. Uh, the slope, uh, for downhill guy it's good, but for me I'm the more combine, combined guy, you know. So for me it's too easy, this downhill, and then it's too hard for me to be fast. Because it's too flat, you know, it's not that technical. But I prefer more difficult slope, like it's B or Adra. Yeah. The 2,857 meter Bernard Rusi designed course features four large jumps and long sweeping turns. Although short in length by World Cup standards, racers say it presents an interesting challenge. With, with how short it is, it actually makes it pretty interesting because you have to really ski accurately and ski with a lot of intensity to, to be fast. And it's going to be a tight race, and I think that's really exciting for the crowd as well. This is remarkable considering just a few weeks ago, this event was in question as construction crews scrambled to finish the gondola and sufficient snow cover remained a concern. I had planned to come here to, to cover these races for, for two years already. And when I asked the officials in the, on the World Cup tour in, in December, will we go to, to Korea? They said, no, no way, we will never go there. There is no gondola working, there is no snowmaking existing and so on. Everybody said it's impossible and the Koreans made the impossible possible. There are hurdles to overcome. The legacy remains in question as local environmentalists demand that the venue be restored back to the state of nature post-Olympics. So I'd like to know how the International Olympic Committee views uh, the maintenance of the facilities at different host countries um, as an Olympic legacy. And it is very important uh, and we look at about the sustainability, the legacy, the environment, etc. Because we don't like white elephants. We don't want facilities just to be there and nobody's using them. So uh, we are working very closely with the organizing committee and are constantly asking for the legacy plans. Discussions will certainly continue regarding plans for the venue after the 2018 Games. But all in all, the general consensus by athletes, officials and foreign media, absolutely fantastic. It's a beauty. It's a downhill which is really made for the Olympics. It's not Kitzbühel or Wengen that we don't need for the Olympics. Normally in sport, it's very, very difficult to reach the maximum number uh, in figure skating or whatever, but uh, I would actually give it 100. <laughs> you never get a second chance to make a first impression, and it looks like Pyeongchang 2018 is off to a great start with the first official Olympic test, receiving plenty of praise from athletes and officials alike. But hold the champagne. This is just one of 28 test events leading up to 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympic Games.
Scientists have made a major discovery that could change the way we understand our universe. Bruce Harrison is live in the studio with me. Now, Bruce, Albert Einstein hypothesized that uh, the existence of what's called the gravitational waves in the universe a century ago, and now scientists say that he's right. Now, what are the implications of this discovery? Sure, well, this is just a very new confirmation, but according to the scientists, they've discovered these so-called gravitational waves, which are ripples in space and time, and uh, they say this opens the door for studying mysterious objects like black holes and neutron stars, but also they said, and maybe this is the most important aspect, it could help in understanding the nature of the very early universe that we live in. Uh, we're hearing that these researchers were searching for these waves for about a decade now. How were they able to make this discovery? Sure. Well, their operations are based in the U.S., and, and they decided the waves using, uh, they detect the waves, rather, using two massive laser, in, laser instruments located in the state of Louisiana in the U.S. and Washington State. And these lasers worked in unison to detect small vibrations from passing gravitational waves. And then the scientists converted that signal into audio waves. So, as one scientist put it, you can actually hear the sounds of the universe. But what created the waves in the first place? Now, that's interesting. According to the scientists, two black holes, each roughly 30 times the mass of the sun, smashed into each other 1.3 billion years ago, creating the waves. Einstein would be beaming, wouldn't he? This is uh, uh, obviously a very, very special moment. Scientists from around the world had a role, including a group of Korean scientists. The Korea Gravitational Wave Group's technology was used in analyzing and monitoring the gravitational waves. The software works to detect within three minutes whether a gravitational wave is real. The scientists from the observatory in the U.S. said they first detected the gravitational waves last September. Major powers have agreed to cease hostilities in Syria in a week from now and quickly provide humanitarian access to besieged towns. But the negotiators were unable to agree on a complete ceasefire or an end to Russian bombing. Representatives from the United States, Russia and a dozen other nations met in Munich to discuss the temporary ceasefire. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry said he's pleased with the effort, but impl implementation is key. But our work today, while it has produced commitments on paper, uh, I want to restate the real test is clearly whether or not all the parties honor those commitments and implement them in reality. Russia said it would not stop airstrikes, saying the temporary ceasefire does not apply to Islamic State or al-Nusra, which is affiliated with al-Qaeda. Uh, Bruce, what about the uh, suspended talks um, in Geneva? I mean, a peace truly cannot be achieved without the opposition forces and the government sitting down face to face. Sure. Well, those talks broke down in the first place because opposition leaders wanted preconditions for those talks. On the other side, you actually have some an analysts saying that Syria doesn't want peace. It just wants to win this war militarily. So um, kind of clashing thoughts there. Right, right. And diplomats really seeking uh, for peace in that area. And so we'll have to see uh, what develops in that region. Yep. All right, Bruce, thank you so much for today and all of this week. I'll see you next week. My pleasure. Yesterday, sunny skies were covered with clouds and rain today, and I'm not complaining. I'm a fan of rainy weather. For more on the latest update, here's our Jihan. Jihan. Hello, Kanyang. Yes, it did rain all day long today with the mountainous regions in Jeju Island seeing more than 300 millimeters of precipitation, while Seoul had about 20 millimeters today. Right. It's, it's a change because it's been a while since we last saw rain. Uh, it's in the forecast for tomorrow as well. That's right. Rain clouds, though, have been hovering over the country all day long, and it has been tapering off as the day went on. And most of the rain clouds have moved out from the peninsula, and showers will take a short break in some parts until tomorrow morning. But a low-pressure system will approach from the southwest, bringing another round of rain showers to the entire 
nation starting tomorrow afternoon. So it's going to be a rainy Saturday tomorrow. So how much rain will we get? About 20 to 60 millimeters for the central parts of the country and 10 to 40 in mostly in the southern provinces. So on that note, let's take a closer look at the readings for tomorrow. Daily low here in Seoul will kick off at 9 degrees Celsius, 11 for Daegu and Busan and Jeju will uh, start off the day at 12 and 15. And as for the daily highs, it's going to be quite mild with a high peaking to 13 here in Seoul, 15 for Daegu and Busan and Jeju Island will see a high of 16 and 20 respectively. But things will brighten up just in time for Valentine's Day this Sunday, but we're expecting a brief cold snap uh, which should linger till early next week. Now that's Korea for you and here's a look at the weather conditions around the world. And that is our broadcast on this Friday night. I'm Moon Ga Young. Thank you for watching, and we hope to see you right back here, same time Monday on News Center.